Yeah, it's been, it's been a long day. <laughs> um, welcome to the post-launch session. We are going to kick off with the lightning talks, and I think first up will be Anurag talking about giving his mum a home router, or access to a home router. Thanks, Mark. So yeah, my mom already has home router. She's at home, she uses the home router. So the talk is primarily about giving my mom access to home router and uh, why I need to give her access. I'll get onto that uh, after I, I, I just, you know, briefly describe the setup at my home. So here's uh, my home network. Uh, there are two uplinks. One is, so both are the consumer grade connection. One is on a GPON from AS134316 and the other one is from, you know, uh, it's on a it's on a cable uh, connection on DOCSIS 3.0, AS17747. They both terminate on a, UB, uh, a Ubiquiti Edge router. So I use Ubiquiti Edge router as the core router at home. Uh, one, and, and the access network is pretty much irrelevant, so I did not re I'm not really going into the access network beyond the router. Uh, the key thing in the setup is uh, I maintain auto redundancy here. So while these are consumer grade connections with static routing, the router takes care of maintaining the high availability by uh, keeping an eye on both links, the primary and secondary. And uh, as soon as one link goes down uh, in the test, it just switches over to the other link within 15 seconds. So it tests against specified targets, which is good, but it, uh, it's also a limitation because if you are testing link against a specific target, and if that target is available while something else is broken, then then also you know you won't detect that other thing is broken. Uh, primary to backup switch, it is visible for things like VoIP calls. So if someone at home is having say a WhatsApp call or anything, it would be visible because. IPs are changing, it will terminate the sessions, it's, there's no BGP or auto redundancy in here. Uh, but at the same time, the switch from backup connection to primary is quite uh, seamless because router will not terminate existing sessions as long as backup is up, it will just seamlessly move, move back. So now comes the case, uh, uh, the other case, which is the DNS resolver. So at my home, um, I cannot use DNS resolver from my ISP because uh, primarily, if I use that, then there's no redundancy because if uplink one is down, there's no point of using resolvers from uplink one. And the other part is both providers have ACLs on their DNS resolver. So even if I want to, I cannot use their, their DNS resolver because if I go to uplink one's DNS from uplink two, it will just block the DNS queries. In theory, I can use Google DNS, OpenDNS, Cloudflare, or PCH, but it's more fun to run a local resolver. Additionally, it's also an issue where um, Maybe with one, you will find problem with respect to privacy policy, or with other, you'll find problem because they don't support client subnet in eDNS for good reasons, but that impacts uh, uh, a lot of things, including uh, how, how you reach Akamai, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. So I end up in running just um, a local unbound server on Raspberry Pi, works perfectly fine. Now, uh, coming to the point, why I need to give my mom access to my home router? So cases when she might have to make changes, well, as I said in start, uh, the home router tests against a specific target. If that target is available while something else is broken, uh, it, will, it will still have issues. So uh, she may say that everything works except, you know, a, a specific social media site or a specific video site suddenly starts buffering. So she may want to switch uplinks because both are available. Uh, while router may not do it on its own, uh, I can script and do tests, but then there is limit of number of tests you can do. You don't want to test again 100 plus targets, it, it would be just useless. The other part is uh, when my mom want, may want to access router is in case Raspberry Pi fails, and in such scenario, she wants to, uh, she may want to use something like say Google DNS or Cloudflare or PCH uh, for, for that time being uh, until I return and fix the Raspberry Pi. So, a way, uh, one of the way uh, to achieve this can be I can just tell her to you know log into the home router, run the command configure, delete the priority. So this so the uplinks are one is on at one, one is on PPPoE zero. So she should delete the failover only, which defines that it's a backup connection from primary, and set it on the secondary, which is a pain, right? So running all these commands telling her would be not so easy. Uh, the other part for DNS would be 
Uh, she goes and deletes from the home network the DNS server config and then adds a new DNS server. So in this example, I just use 8888 and 4444, or, or you know, could be, could be Cloudflare or anything else. So a better way out here can be use Ansible plus Semaphore. This is an open source UI for Ansible to get Supermom. Here are the simple playbooks which I'm using to achieve this. It's just, it's just a plain playbook. Uh, it's making use of EdgeOS config module. EdgeOS config just passes the configuration lines. It's exactly the configuration lines as you may type on the router uh, from, from, the, from the root. And uh, it, it just makes sure that it commits the, commits the configuration once, once it's added. And then I have another module. I, I have the same module with the save yes command, which will make sure that the new config is saved. So here's, here's how the setup looks like. Um, she has a web UI access with all these playbooks. I've told her only to use these playbooks. She can go to any of the playbooks and just click run. As soon as she clicks run, it just does that. The semaphore is hosted on a container far away, and that's always available because um, uh, Raspberry Pi maintains high availability with that remote server over, over multiple VPN links with FRR and OSPF. Uh, one important thing here is uh, for resolving to the to the to the uh, host name I use for Semaphore, I have the static config in place on the router, so that if DNS fails, it, it's still available and you don't end up in depending on it. Important links: Ansible, of course, for uh, for using in the backend for actually executing it. Semaphore for web UI. Other option can be Ansible Tower, but I just I just found it a bit bulky to run on a on a low end container. And probably uh, an overkill for such a simple task. Uh, Atom for, for just uh, putting, putting the code. And autocomplete Ansible plug plugin for Atom. Quite useful if you're trying to write a YAML. Uh, for Ansible, it just, it just takes care of, uh, of uh, you know, telling you when, when there's something wrong in the syntax. And uh, EdgeOS module for, for the Ansible. This is the Ub Ubiquiti EdgeOS module. It's already there in the Ansible library. You can just start using it by putting it in the playbook. That's about it. Any questions? Backup fail ever. Uh, hey, great talk, um, uh, Walt from Hurricane Electric. I was just wondering, did your mom actually uh, do this work? Yes, there have been a couple of times when um, suddenly uh, the, the 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 TV serials she is watching they start buffering, and she ends up in just going and changing uplink. And while I designed it, and primarily the idea was she will do it when I'm not at home, but there have been times when she just starts doing it even when I'm at home. And how long did it take you to train your mom to do? Router work? Not much, not much. And it's just web UI. It's as, as simple as using email. So she was already familiar with things like email, Facebook, and other things. So it's just one more portal where I just go and log in. The login details are already saved on her laptop in LastPass. So it's, it's pretty seamless for her. Really good job. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Thank you, Anurag. Um, <laughs> next up, we'll have Aftab to talk about the rise of IPv6. All right, everyone. Um, hello, Aftab Siddiqui here. I'll be quick. Um, it's a lightning one, though. Right, so you all are aware of the IPv6 status, what's happening. It's going up. Um, we have seen in the IPv6 session, everything is in Kidori. Uh, everyone is happy. That's good. Um, but there's a part and parcel with that. When something is going so well, it comes along with a lot of problems. So these are the number of incidents um, in the last 45 days. I captured the date is 11th of February. Um, it's, I captured it from the BGP stream. So they are around, around about 290, 300 incidents. Incident like BGP hijack only, no leaks. So only whatever is considered as a hijack by BGP stream, uh, is captured here. So you can see the number of incidents are pretty much consistent. Some are, some days are quite, just because it's weekend, nobody's changing anything. But um, yeah, other days you do have 10, 15 quite easily. So what happens? It's a long list. Um, and just remember, these are all only IPv6 hijacks. So, and I only captured it from um, if the victim were from the Asia-Pacific region, right? So there's a long list for one of the organization in 
uh, ISP in uh, Africa, which is uh, Angola Cables. I don't know what they were doing, uh, but they literally hijacked a lot of prefixes for no reason. And they did it for some of the V4 as well, but predominantly mostly for V6. Uh, the list continues. Um, here they are. So that's from the Hurricane Electric, the BGP, uh, so the IPv6 bogons are also increasing uh, because uh, the uptake of v6 isn't going up, so of course the number of bogons are going up as well. It's uh, not a very sharp increase, but yes, it's increasing. It, it, it doesn't match with, the, uh, with this graph, but it is increasing. Right. So, this is um, from the. Um, so I captured it from the uh, um, NRO delegation file. Um, I wanted to use um, CIDR report as well, but I said, okay, fine, let me do something different this time. Um, and then I I checked it all the way back two years uh, with the route views, uh, rib dumps, um, one month uh, every day and uh, just to make sure that they were actually in the routing table. Uh, so these are the prefixes from the uh, Asia Pacific region, which are constantly been on the routing table for last two years. Probably they are there for more than that, but I didn't check it. So I'm just saying probably two years. Um, one of them, some of, some of them I was just checking that they have just vanished in 2020. There were four prefixes um, uh, coming out uh, from one country and they fixed it and they were there for almost one and a half year. So somebody woke up, like, thankfully. But these are there for that at least for two years. One of them is uh, the Spectrum core network for last six months. Um, the one thing is, I, don't, I just want to clarify. So I looked up their, so all, there were not many of them. So I just looked up the AS path. Number one, I just checked if these origin AS are announcing any V4 bogon. But quite sur surprisingly, none of them are. So what happened with the V6 part? I have no idea. Um, then I looked up the AS path and their peers. The active AS path in, 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 in these announcement, I didn't find any Bogon announcement for V4 from any of them. So that was again quite surprising to me that uh, why all these ASNs, uh, why all these ISPs are blocking the V4 part with the V4 uh, prefixes but not the V6. So they are quite actively dropping if the V4 is a Bogon but not if V6 is a Bogon. So something is broken somewhere. So um, that was a quick thing. I just uh, looked it up. I just wanted to share here. Um, and again, a plug for the manners that uh, the number of incidents are going down as the number of our manners participants are going up. Uh, luckily, none of the manners participants was involved in the V6 Bogon announcement. So I can say that here at least. So that was my uh, five minutes of fame here. If you have any question, I mean the data, I mean I can share the data. We can look it up. I didn't do any um, heavy calculations on that. Um, I'm not sure where that guy is from the Japanese university who did some AI on calculations and I wanted to share the data with him so that he can run it for 20, 25 years and see what else is there. He's not here in the audience, but anyway, if you have any questions, please. No, good. Any questions for AFTAP? Did you ever hear back from Angola Telecom? No, they have never responded. I reached out to them. The uh, abuse C contact is they are accepting me, accepting email but not responding. So it's not a black hole. So it's there, but it's I not. might know a guy. We'll That's, follow up. Okay. Yes. Any questions? No, no. Uh, the, it was an event. No, or? no. The B, the hijack was only for a uh, few hours. Probably they found the problem and fixed it, but not sure what happened. Um, why? But, why they started originating so many V6 prefixes from their own AS. So, no, not, no idea. 
from memory, they hijacked some of mine as well. Um, I, I recall this event. I think it was... Uh, I'm trying to remember when. Was it 2018? Or no, no, no. So these are only for 45 days. So last okay. 45 days. So well, if you Well, then they've done it more than yeah, once. That's gone. So, yeah, but anyway, so... It's I'll have a look in my email. I think I have something about it. I'll, I'll okay, if know. they have... They did it in 2018, then yeah, that's a serial abuse. I'll send someone an email and copy you. Perfect. Find out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aftab. Um, next up, we'll have Joao talking about signing the root thing. Yeah, so I'm John Amas. I work for APNIC, and uh, one of the things I do on the side sort of thing is that I am one of the trusted community representative, representatives <coughs> in the process of signing the route. And uh, this is about what happened last week, which was one of the scheduled uh, ceremonies. And it was a bit different. But just so everyone is on the same page, this is how the route signing process goes on. Every three months, Verisign, who is uh, in charge of publishing the originating the zone that Diana sends to them, sends to the IANA uh, three uh, key signing requests, <coughs> each with the corresponding zone signing key that will be used for each of the months uh, to sign the root zone. Uh, these are signed by the IANA in the process, which is a, a root signing ceremony, and they use a, cer a certain number of items. Of course, the key signing key, which is the master key for everything else, uh, is not available to anyone except uh, it's kept in four devices, hardware security models, HSMs, that are stored at two facilities, one in California, one in the east coast of the United States. When you get together, you need all these items uh, at the same time for things to work. So the HSMs I mentioned store the, the keys in a way that cannot be extracted, and uh, basically you send them the data that you want to sign. They, it's a small computer. They sign it and return the signed data to you. Uh, they are stored uh, on one of two safes that are present at each of the locations. The other safe contains chip cards that are used to enable the HSMs, otherwise they won't work. And at any given time to make them operational, you need three of a total of seven existing cards. So <clears throat> the access to these cards, which is inside the second safe, uh, is through uh, what we call the TCRs, people who uh, keep the keys that open the deposit box inside the safe uh, and extract each of these cards. So you need at least three of these seven people that are assigned to each of the two locations to be there present at, for the ceremony to, to be able to go on. And then there's ancillary uh, equipment like a laptop to process the whole thing. Uh, one important thing is that each of these items, each individual item, is stored in what uh, banks and people who transport secure things uh, call a temper evident bag. It's a plastic bag where you can see what's inside, uh, and when you put it in, um, it's sealed and cannot be opened without actually being very evident that someone has attempted to open it or has cut through it. Uh, each of these bags has uh, a unique ID provided by the manufacturer, so you check against what the number that you put uh, was in the bag that you put the three months before. And if they match, you know that no one uh, tinkered with any of the things. <clears throat> so this time around last week, it was a bit different. Um, there are two types of uh, actions that happen. There is the key signing ceremony, which is uh, what I was talking about. And then from time to time, there are what they call administrative ceremonies in which uh, maintenance work is done, okay? So what happened this time? The locks on the two safes uh, were getting old. They were, were being uh, end of life by the, by the manufacturer. So Ayana, as you would expect, decided, well, before they fail, let's replace them. Bought a couple of them, called the locksmith in. He, op he opened the, the, the Ayana people opened the first safe. Um, the locksmith accessed the lock from the inside, replaced it, put it back, everything was fine. Come the second, the second safe, it wouldn't open at all. They spent two hours fiddling with the thing, it just wouldn't open. I mean, it just had to open this one last time, right? But that's Murphy at work. So never mind, you call a locksmith. Surely there are ways of opening a safe. Um, and off you go. You get the equipment, 
the guy starts drilling. It's not exactly the fastest of processes, which, as you expect, a safe is not to be open in five minutes if you don't have the combination lock, right? You'll notice that he's drilling just below the axis of the lock. So he then lo looks. They have these scopes which are thin lines of fiber optic that allow you to look inside cavities. And it's like, what the hell? I cannot see the lock. Can we have, does anyone remember what the other lock looked like? Well, it wasn't installed in the vertical position. It was installed in the horizontal position. So that hole was not leading anywhere. <laughs> Never mind. You start again. As you see, it's a very exciting process. <laughs> It takes ages to get through. Anyway, Murphy, once it's, he starts going, he won't stop. Something got stuck in the drilling inside the hole, and it was necessary to, amount, to exercise a little bit of additional force to penetrate the safe. This is what the lock looks like. Okay? It's massive, missing the back plate, where the, all the electronics um, are. You'll notice. When, well, when, when, when he used excessive force, that back plate came off. When the back plate comes off, comes off, there is this little device here, which becomes free. This lever drops, and the slide plate locks itself, preventing the bolt from ever moving again. <laughs> it's like, OK, what now? <laughs> This is no longer a standard open, lock opening process. The whole thing is like we have a, hole, a, a, a safe with two holes and a, a lock that's uh, destroyed and uh, the standard tools won't work on it anymore. Never mind, this guy's a professional. Off comes the angle grinder and a bit of wire. Sparks fly, gives the, sh the proper shape to hooks, and off you go. Finally, he actually managed to open it. Uh, the only problem is to took two days of work. <clears throat> During these two days, uh, at least eight people were inside this safe room, control access, just looking at the guy, drilling <laughs> inch by inch, or millimeter by millimeter. Um, <clears throat> is this an exceptional process? Apparently not. I didn't know that about uh, safes. But um, one of the things that most the safe manufacturers and the lock manufacturers do when they produce the safe is that they make available things for just this situation, because apparently it happens day in and day out. Breaking into safes is something that the locksmith has to do as a matter of fact. This is a template so to let you know where, for each uh, lock model, you have to ins drill in order to access the release system of the lock. It happens so often that they sell this to you. It's $30, $40. Okay? When you are done, of course, you are not going to want to have a safe with holes. So what do you do? You buy a safe repair kit, which is just like a box of little bits of metal of different sizes that you are supposed to insert into a hole, because that's what you do. The instructions to use these and then repair it, you can download them. It's available to anyone. And the drill, the sophisticated drill that you're seeing in the pics, you can buy online. They sell it for you. It's no problem. It's just life of a locksmith, apparently. Once you are done, what do you do? Well, you plug the holes. You put some plaster on the outside, some epoxy. You paint it. You dry the paint. Then uh, the little bits that stick out, you basically uh, wear them out with an angle grinder. And, uh, and you are done. You install the new lock, and the whole ceremony can continue. So after two days of drilling, and uh, two days of waiting for this guy to show up, uh, just, just three hours before having to leave for the airport myself, coming here, we managed to start the original plan and get it done. This is a process that uh, any of you can watch online when it happens. Uh, in the, in the first page, I, I, I posted the URL where you can go get the scripts that we follow for the ceremony, where all the steps are detailed. It's all done live. Um, archival materials are, ke are kept. Uh, you can go watch them if, if you so desire. It's 
pretty boring. But uh, all is good. The internet is gone again. Uh, some people were saying, well, this was exceptional. Did the, the, was the internet at risk? Was the root zone at risk? No, it's apparently this is just a matter of everyday life. Uh, there's proce processes and procedures. Diana conducted this in a quite transparent manner. We were there all the time reporting. Uh, the, everything that happened is taped on videos. There's external auditors from one of these auditing companies. And so no panic. That simple. That's it. Anyone got any questions? Thank you so much. Any questions? How to crack a safe? <laughs> Why do they need to be kept? What does it need to be kept in a safe instead of in a safe deposit box in a bank? <clears throat> because this way, uh, there's a trace of everything that happens in the bank. Who knows? Other people may access that room or the safe deposit box. Everything here is under control of Diana, and everything is kept on, with logs, uh, taped. Uh, the, the device, the, the, the ICANN has a, a safe room that they build out with three tiers of security, which itself is inside an Equinix facility. So of course, the Equinix people log when you go in. Basically, the idea here is that everything that's done is logged, and anyone can then later uh, have a look at what happened and when it happened. Any other questions? Great. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next up, we'll have Terry. Is Terry around? Yep. yep. There we go. Uh, from IXA to talk about the uh, conference network. Um, yeah. Right there. Cool. Uh, last time I came up here, I asked the question before I started the presentation How's the Wi Fi? Hands up if you've had any problems. Never, oh. <laughs> great, great. Well, that's interesting. I've got a good story for you then. So um, first thing I'll do, I'll, I'll thank our sponsors. We, we had a lot of assistance from uh, Vocus, um, obviously from uh, Extreme, um, every AP and every switch in the joint that's been used for the uh, network actually has been supplied by Extreme. Uh, we had two transit providers. Uh, Cloudflare and Vocus, obviously we had to have a backup. And then uh, IX Australia provided peering to Vic IX and also uh, another backup slash extended reach peering. And we had some help from Arista. We, the last minute, got a, a loan device from Arista, which we used for, in a novel fashion for the conference. Now, I don't know if you've heard the expression from Eisenhower, he, he says, uh, planning is indispensable, but plans are useless. So I can say now categorically that I definitely found that out as well with the conference. Um, we actually, where's the? Oh, here we go. So we can see the layout here. Um, up here we have what we call Bio East, which is actually a data cabinet just on the other side of that wall. So all, all of the network on this side of the. Uh, room and also over to M1 through to M4 where we had some of the workshops is all serviced from that area. And then down here we have something called Bio West, which is a really nice little storage room full of cardboard and a data rack for the other side of the building here. Consequently, I was in there the other day and the Canon man was in there getting his uh, carbon out for the copy machines they have an on-site canner serviceman. And it's a room full of cardboard and he's using one of those jet lighter things to take the cardboard out of, you know. yeah. So he was literally undoing those lovely blue straps off a pallet and lighting them on fire. So you can imagine my reaction when I saw that. And of course, uh, amazingly, when I came in here on the Friday before the conference, I found out about the third room. So all of these areas over here, instead of being able to cover them with extreme APs, I convinced the, um, the hotel to just duplicate the apricot SSID over there. So if you've been over there using the Wi-Fi, it's actually not us. <laughs> Sorry. But so in BioWest, we were um, extremely lucky to get our friends at Crown, who have been excellent for this project, to 
uh, drop some dark fibre in there from Vocus, and we uh, terminate that with two bi dies at, at uh, 10 gig each. So the conference has been running with 10 gig of bandwidth of our backbone, which has been, you know, very, very useful. So uh, I suppose the other thing that uh, Crown helped us out with is we've got, for our staff, we managed to get contractor passes. So I um, can go out the back there and uh, have a bit of a fiddle in their cabinets and, and not get accosted by security or arrested and so on, which is quite handy. And uh, yeah, obviously, big thank you for Crown because they did a fantastic job of looking after us with the network. This building has an amazingly well-documented structured cabling except for M3. I'll tell you about that later. So. One of the things that we did with the Arista for the Internet Gateway is it, it ran a, what we call a field, was it a field version or a field engineering version of their software? So it's the first time I've seen an Arista actually do ROV in the wild. So the conference was running on an Internet Gateway which was actually um, validating route origin. So that was really cool. So thanks to the Arista guys for that. So over the last nine days, obviously I don't have a day's worth of grass for today, but we started with the, the workshops Wednesday last week and uh, yeah, they didn't really push the network much, which was good. I didn't have much trouble with the APs. Uh, but uh, we had a lot of fun on the first day, Tuesday this week. So when the conference program ramped up on midday on Tuesday, uh, this room, which was fully extended out for the whole, whole promenade, had probably nearly every conference attendee in here, probably 400 to 500 people, with their phones and their laptops. So that was 1,106 active devices in this room at one time. And then everyone had trouble. So you put your hands up, because you probably had trouble on Wednesday for sure, because our friends at Crown left the APs on in this room and the next one. So sorry, you actually spent the opening plenary bathed in um, interference from the Arubas, which you can probably see around the ceiling here at the moment. So apologies for that. Should have chased that one up myself. Now the workshops, we, we actually gave them all different subnets, a different VLAN and some static IPv6 and V4 to play with. They didn't really push the network much. In fact, no one's actually pushed the network up to 20 gigs, sorry. Uh, Tom could have probably you know, arranged the DDoS or something so we could see what it could do, but oh well. But yeah, and then of course, um, Jordy did his IPv6 only workshop the other day and actually pushed some traffic through the network. Great. Uh, as for where the traffic is coming from, where it was going, uh, you can see that, uh, uh, yeah, Vocus did the heavy lifting on global transit for the whole conference, which was fantastic. A uh, bit of interstate traffic. Um, those of you who uh, saw the problem we had the other day with the submission site with um, APNIC in, uh, in Brisbane. Turned out to be just a routing loop between, of all places, Hurricane Electric and TPG. So some of the V4 was going to Perth and back and the V6 was going to San Jose and back. So, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, yeah, Tom, thank you, mate. You actually managed to send us some traffic. Thank you for that. And, of course, our local um, pop here is named Vic IX, that's over in Collins Street in two sites, King Street, uh, M1, which is just down the road where our dark fibre terminates, and a little further down the road from that, we've got ME1 at Equinix. So Vic IX contributed a small amount of traffic, so that was great. So with the APs um, that we've been using, uh, Extreme actually has them reporting back to a cloud platform, which they have branded for us nicely. They're called Extreme Cloud IQ. It's not an oxymoron, I guarantee you that. So, all good. But, yeah, we had some really interesting results from, you know, especially unique client count. So, over the, the nine days where I've done this dump from, we've had nearly, you know, 2,500 active devices on the Wi-Fi network here, which is amazing. Um, just keep in mind, we only had 500 registered attendees, we probably had another 20 or 30 support staff here. So that's probably four to five devices per person for the entire conference. So how many people here have four or five devices at the conference? Warren, you got 10, oh, no wonder. Yeah. Okay, 
But uh, interestingly, um, I've just I've dumped the um, cross, well, the just a little bit of that window there, but that is really important. So 37, 22. Yeah, so half the devices using the Wi-Fi across the network have obviously been either Apple phones or Android phones of some kind. So that was an interesting statistic too, which means everyone's walking around with a laptop, everyone's walking around with a phone, probably another laptop, probably another phone. So yeah. By the way, who brought two laptops? Oh, you probably bought a laptop and an iPad and a phone. Yeah, you, of course you did. Yeah, okay. So all good. Um, thank you, everyone who turned up at the conference and then did, then did their Apple updates, because we got you, we, we've recorded you. So who owns the Millennium Falcon? Are you in the room? Is the Millennium Falcon here? Oh, that was funny. Okay. Um, who here is uh, in charge of IT at AP Nick? Can you tell me who that is? Who turned up at the conference and did their Apple updates? <laughs> you did? <laughs> Good stuff. Okay. So, uh, of course, the, this, this is no surprise these days. If you guys have done any work on any DPI platforms, everything's wonderfully obscured now by TLS, so you, you're not going to see anything. Obviously, with, with this um, SSL, 40% of the traffic minimum, yeah, no, no big deal. Very, very usual these days. Okay. Now, you've probably seen the, there's an AP here, an AP here, and an AP here. We've given them all names uh, and where they are, but um, what was interesting is FM8. Who knows where that one is? Who can guess? Coffee. Yes, it's right next to the coffee cart. <laughs> of course it is, of course it is. I, I thought it was quite interesting. I, I kept going past the coffee cart and going, why are all these people camped here on laptops? And then I realised it's coffee, Wi-Fi. What else? What else could it be? Yeah, indeed. And ice cream, yes, indeed. Um, this is an interesting little fellow. Whips is out there. He's um, near, I think he's near, uh, what is it? The, not, he's opposite the PCCW stand. So there's an a AP next to PCCW and opposite the PCCW stand there's Whips. Now he is there just to monitor all of the RF. So it was just basically soaking up what everyone was doing and essentially trying to work out how to bounce you around on the roaming and so on. So that was rather interesting. Uh, so scaling down, you can just see it's, you know, very much a, a fairly clean distribution of whether areas are busy or not. Um, M M7 was a meeting room, not terribly busy. Uh, P3, which is next door, not, not to totally busy, so all good. Switch over to um, how many actual users were ever on the APs. Now, the uh, platform actually collects who's using what switch. So between the two switches, the switch that's over here and the switch that's in BioWest, uh, we sort of split very evenly. That's, that's, that's pretty much certain. Um, of course, FP1, who can guess where FP1 is? Because we're standing in P1, so FP1 is the access point that's sitting there. And of course, FM8, you already know about that guy, he's next to the coffee cart, so all good. But amazingly, it also gives us an idea of how much traffic was passing by as far as um, devices are concerned you know, at these locations. So M M6 is where one of the workshops was, uh, P3 uh, next door, um, M2 is down the other end of the corridor where the, one of the workshops was. So. It just falls off. But these are unique users who were actually on that particular AP at any time in the last nine days. So very interesting stats. So uh, what did we learn? I learned I should come to a conference and not let it run on public IP addresses without a firewall. Because I got a really interesting email from Osset this morning <laughs> saying, hello, what are you doing on this address space? Because there's a ton of people walking around who are getting scanned and running with open ports. So, yeah, I think next time, firewall, that's a good idea. Yeah, which also means um, if you've got cloud-managed devices which are, uh, don't really need inbound connections, yeah, let's just put them on some you know, fake address space and let them be natted so they can talk. Um, as far as the actual, let's call it, help desk queries were concerned, 
really they boiled down to people just turning up with, with old drivers and old hardware. So people would turn up with either um, hardware that would only do 2.4 gig, because we actually intended to run the conference without having any 2.4 gig, or they turned up with hardware which was um, seriously out of date on software updates. So that, that made for fun. And of course, my other key one is, if you're going to get the hotel to turn off their Wi-Fi, go through with a spectrum analyzer and make sure they turned off their Wi-Fi. So that, um, we've had some interesting, uh, crazy ideas for the uh, next conference, which we'll, which we'll uh, probably suggest. And that's actually to have an SSID that's V6 only and let people test out what would happen if they're roaming around in the wild with only V6. And the one thing that we didn't get to do with this network, which I'd love to do with a network at some stage in this sort of environment, is to actually have um, IPv6 uh, prefix delegation. So you can set up a device and grab a piece of address space and make it your own. So I'll, um, I'll quickly, this is a standard thing from Tom. Everyone sign your outs. But OK, so questions. Ah, oh, here we go, Tom. Hey, so Tom Paseco, Cloudflare. Um, these access points were Wi-Fi 6. Yes. Uh, how much Wi-Fi 6 clients did you see? None. None? None. I saw a lot of AC clients. OK. Yeah. Um, because like I have an iPhone 11, which should be speaking. It 6. should be talking AX? OK. Yeah. Well, um, fortunately, I didn't pull the report because I didn't see enough of those. OK. Yeah. Martin Levy from the same company, Cloudflare. Um, could you go back a slide? Right. So let's rename the crazy ideas with, you know, what makes more sense. And then secondly, on your learnings, um, yes, in a way, I actually want you to keep the concept of an open network and not go 1918, because 1918 doesn't mention anything about V6. So that bullet item is a very mm. sort of V4-centric statement. Yeah. And most devices that we have these days, although they're more liable to be the more protected ones, have got V6 enabled on them. Joe Random Phone. Yeah. Oops, shouldn't have done that. Um, et cetera. But you mentioned about the run the IPv6 only. In this day and age, why not come to the conference with Apricot, the, the, the um, SSID that we're all keeping from previous mm. meetings, and just make that a pure V6 only network? Then you can have an apricot we, dash legacy yeah. for those people that realize there's something missing in their life well, while we, here. We almost and, did it and, this and this morning. is not actually, sorry, I'm, I'm going to keep talking. Yeah, um, those people that know me know I do this. Um, <laughs> that isn't so much a question, and it isn't so much a request. Mm. It's no. <laughs> no, it's actually like the time has come. Mm. Just do it. Yes. You run a network and you work for a company that spends an awful lot of time saying V6. We should be able to walk in here and realize, oh, this is only V6. Live with it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we seriously debated actually surprising everyone at the conference this morning with turning off V4. And we almost did it. We almost did it just, just to see what would happen. But it's, it's like it's the production environment, let's not do that, okay. Three short questions. Number one, why didn't you use the existing conference network? I'm John Brewer, I'm an internet vandal. Okay, um, without really talking out of shop because they're, it, it's in, in a contract with, with the host, they're only prepared to give us um, 300 megabits per second of uh, internet access for the entire venue. Okay, so that's fine. Um, number two, did you have host isolation on on the wireless yes. network? Okay. Yes. And so all, all all endpoints that were wireless were not allowed to talk to each other. The APs were also smart enough to do some filtering of certain traffic, but what they were not smart enough to do, and this is without this is that without denigrating our friends at Hive slash Extreme, they weren't smart enough to filter inbound traffic on their management ports. So the management was running on the same VLAN as the... No. 
Okay. No. So <coughs> the management was on a completely separate VLAN, but it was on a public IP address. Oh, oh that's clever. Yes. Uh, clever is not what I'm actually meaning to say. Um, last question Go was how... Go for scan right now. Go on. How, Go on. how did you do the RF planning? Actually, we didn't have to. Uh, the platform has enough smarts in it to actually bump the APs around. Actually, that's why that little sensor follows out the front there, because it essentially says, OK, we've got interference here, interference there, and it will make a recommendation to the operators to just bounce it onto a new channel. OK. I'll, I'll take that as being magic. Well, they, they call it machine learning, but you and I know that's just black magic, okay. you know, disguised somewhere. Statistics. Thank you. Done. Hi, it's me again. Um, continuing on Martin's comment, um, in previous APNX, we've actually had uh, Apricot dash, oh, sorry, uh, Apricot Minix, we've had Apricot dash 646 XLAT or V6 only networks. Um, mm. uh, I can remember them being years ago and being absolutely horrible and nothing working, but it would be worthwhile doing that again. So yeah. please do that. Okay. I'll, I'll take that one under advisement. No worries. Any other questions? I think I'll ask Martin or Tom what's it like to have Cloudflare as a transit provider. But yeah. Well, um, it was actually magic transit, but yeah. Magic transit. Magic transit. Okay. Like magic RF. Like magic RF. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Terry. Um, next up, we'll have uh, AFTAP again to talk to us about Slurm file generator, AS0 Bogon. Hi, everyone. After I'm here, it's just a shout out to a small um, a script which one of my friend um, who happened to work with for ISO just wrote. So it's I didn't do anything, it's just we worked together and on this thing. Um, but it's its creation, so I'm just sharing with you. You have heard about the AS0 ROA um, and why we need that and what is the purpose of that. So the thing is, what we are trying to test is how you, you check how much um, ROAs is going to generate, right? So, and there are plenty for sure. Um, APNIC has, has already announced that they have uh, it, a experimental tell available uh, which you can use in case you want to have, um, if, if you want to try that, there will be around 1,500 ROAs in it. Uh, so you can see what's happening. Um, you can do that. Or you can do one more thing. You can use this script. Uh, it's available here. Uh, it will generate, uh, there are two options. Um, it can go to uh, the Team Cymru, um link, which provides the Bogan references for V4 and V6, or it can go to the um, NRO delegated file. Um, it's a simple switch. You can uh, use minus N uh, for the NRO and no switch to just use the Team Cymru link. Uh, it will generate a slum file. And what is a slum file? Uh, slum file is simple, simplified local internet number resource management. Uh, it is a file based on JSON, uh, defined in the RFC 8416. Uh, what the purpose of that is uh, you add it into, the, into your validator, and it will start treating it uh, as if it is getting it from uh, a tell, right? So it will. So let me give you an example. So this is the example of the uh, slum file which uh, that script would create. So it will say, okay, fine, so AS, ASN is zero, prefix is this, and max precinct length is 32. So the moment it, is, it says AS zero, of course, uh, something pops up from another AS, it will be termed as invalid. So you can populate it, there will be around a quarter of million entries in it. It's going to be long because of the V6. Um, not many in V4. You can filter out the V4 part as well if you want to. Uh, but if you create the whole file, you can just add it. It's not that big. You can just add it into a validator and see what is the impact it is creating, uh, how many um, prefixes you are dropping uh, just because of AS0 ROAs. Uh, on top of that, which I haven't tested yet, uh, Max is working on it. So by the way, I just didn't mention his name. That's Max Stuckey's uh, job. He did it. Uh, he's also working with Ripe, uh, Ripe NCC to, uh, in the um, assessment part. They are doing a um, policy analysis and assessment. So yeah, so this, is, this, this creates a file. It's generated, and you can add it. On top of that, you can also use the script which uh, Job Snyder wrote, and which can tell you the impact 
uh, of how many invalids you are dropping. Uh, so you can combine those and see what is the result. It's all controlled environment. It doesn't impact your infrastructure if you are using in the lab. So just for the um, testing purpose, try to use it. It's, it's quite handy. I'm, uh, I've, I've installed it. It's, the new version just came out last night. Uh, with the new switch because I requested for that one. So that is there. Uh, just, I just want to share that. If, uh, if you have anything, I'm happy to discuss it with you, but uh, Max wrote it, so um, you can reach out to him as well. That's it, if you have any question. That just um, strikes me, or Terry, Terry Sweetser from IX Australia, if you didn't know. Um, this strikes me as incredibly useful for automating um, a block list on any firewall or any border router anywhere. So that's, um, has anyone actually contemplated doing that? I suppose they have, haven't they? I mean, uh, so we have played around it. Um, we do it a lot in the workshops, mm. right? Because it's really difficult to create, uh, to get uh, the whole routing table from the internet and then show that what you're getting it from the validators. So we tested, I mean, I'm pretty sure Warren has done it as well, um, and Tashi is, if it's a, he's around. I mean, we, we do it a lot in the, uh, in the lab and say, oh, wow, this is a verified ROA, it's, in verify, uh, it's invalid ROA. So we do it, but nothing, I've never done it in a production network. So, yeah. It, it would be interesting to do it with AS0 because what, whatever you are blocking is just a bogon. Mm. So theoretically, it shouldn't impact any um, any of your uh, um, production net, uh, um, production traffic, but the reason why we added uh, NRO delegation versus the Team Cymru delegation, Team Cymru. Um, I mean, if there's anyone from that part of the region, I don't know. It, it they pronounce as Cymru. It spells that Cymru, uh, but their their list is not complete in my understanding they don't add anything which is considered as reserved. Uh, CIDR report adds everything which considered as reserved. Anything which is, which is not available, Jeff will add it in the Bogon because he takes it from the NRO delegation file and that's why we are taking it from the, from the NRO delegation file. If you wanted to play really, very, very safe, you can use the Team Kamu file. So it will not impact any of your production traffic at all. Because in the past life, um, I used to have uh, the BGP feed from uh, TC, uh, the Team Cymru, and uh, it never impacted our um, production traffic at all. We never received any complaint. So, uh, and I d did the diff. There are around four to 5,000 prefixes differ uh, from Team Cymru to the NRO delegation. Cool. So, yeah, if you want to try on a production network, try with the team company, not with the NRO, NRO delegation file. Thank you. Anyone? No? All good. Thank you. Thanks, Aftab. <laughs> Next up, we'll have Paul Brooks giving us an update on law enforcement and encryption. Old bones can still do that. Okay, so I don't have any slides because this is uh, sort of uh, an update of uh, some things that happened uh, just yesterday. Uh, primarily for the Australians in the room, but increasingly more for, for people uh, across in, in other jurisdictions as well. Um, governments, law enforcement agencies are trying to look for ways of getting access to the, uh, the messages that are in encrypted messaging streams. And so we're seeing requests to Facebook coming from the governments of Australia and the US and the UK to say, uh, we know you are thinking of making your messaging system secure and having, uh, making it encrypted end to end and they're not now. Please don't do that because we want to see your users' messages because we want it. some of them are terrorists and pedophiles. Uh, and Facebook said, get stuff, we're making it encrypted anyway. Um, so that's, I mean, that's okay. In Australia, we've had a set of laws with various titles. I mean, we call it the assistance and access laws, which basically give for the first time the security agencies the authority to issue an ISP or anyone that runs a website, even if it's the local soccer club 
or anyone that runs a messaging platform or anyone that runs a data centre, anyone that supplies or uh, things to one of those things, anyone that sells any of those sort of things, anyone that stocks items that might be used as a form of CPE, so the guy behind the counter at Harvey Norman, uh, could get issued with a notice from the authorities to actively make changes to the system to remove security features so that they can get access to the messaging uh, and you're not allowed to tell anybody. So, big problem. Anyway, long story short, this has been law for about a year or so. Uh, we in Internet uh, Australia and the Internet Society uh, and uh, ISOC uh, Asia Pacific have been pushing back on this in Australia, uh, some of the things in India. Uh, the UK's had laws for a, for a while, working on those. And yesterday we had a hearing up in Canberra, which I had to run up to to, to speak at, where we had presentations from small organisations like ASIO, the Independent Commission Against Corruption, the Human Rights Commission, um, us, uh, Electronic Frontiers Australia, Atlassian, they're, they're obviously concerned because this provides a risk a perception of risk that their systems might have been compromised and they can't actually tell anyone if they have or not. So if you're looking at buying some of these systems, uh, you might be thinking twice and go and buy something from another country. Uh, Mozilla, Martin, I think, at the back, talked about uh, some of the things that they do for protecting the password store in, in uh, the browsers so that even they can't see what's going in, so there's no point in issuing a notice on us. We can't give you any data anyway. Uh, anyway, so the good news is this hearing was with a guy who's independent of government. He's a lawyer specifically put on to review the legislation with less of a government bias. And his term, full term, is the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor. Uh, and the things that came out of that, which we were quite heartened to see, actually looks like it's validating all the things that we put in our submission to request. So things like confirmation that the security agencies won't issue notices to people, but to the whole corporation. So we've been concerned as an industry that they could issue a notice to a low-level programmer somewhere at desk somewhere and get them to make changes to the operating system of a piece of kit that even the management of the company that supplies that kit wouldn't know had happened uh, and put inject backdoors that way. Uh, so confirmation that that won't happen. Win. Um, confirmation that, uh, or at least suggestions that it'll be changed so that if you are a service provider, if you're an ISP and you get one of these notices and the security, uh, the uh, confidentiality provision says you'll go to jail if you tell anyone that you've got one, actually stopped you from hiring a lawyer or an advisor to help you and work out what you should do with one of these notices. Big organisations have a, have a legal team, little tiny mum and, shop, uh, mum, mum and pop um, software guys don't. Uh, so it looks like they're going to change it so that you will be allowed to hire a lawyer. You will be able to hire a specialist technical advisor as well. That's not in the laws at the moment, uh, but they're going to probably add that in. Uh, so you can get some help uh, to work out whether you're going to respond to a notice or not and how you're going to do it and uh, to make sure that your response is according to the law but doesn't go too far. Uh, one of the big changes it looks like coming in is the laws at the moment says that the notices get issued by the head of an agency, so the head of ASIO can authorise the notice, but they're supposed to evaluate, self-evaluate, whether it's reasonable and proportional, whether it's going to achieve the result, that it won't uh, disable security and things like that, and they're supposed to self-assess. We're a little bit concerned that maybe they're not quite as independent as they need to be, that their self-assessment might be a little bit biased. Uh, it looks like what they're going to bring in is a independent review by some retired judges, helped by a whole pile of technical specialists, and so all these notices, proposed notices, will get reviewed by competent, independent, unbiased experts as to what the effect is likely to be before they can hand it to you and say, we'd like you to do this. And that is going to be a huge win. Um, and one of the other main things that it looks like he's going to recommend is that no matter which the agency is that is going to hand you a notice to say, we want you to do this and not tell anybody about it, uh, 
they're looking to standardise at least the form, because these notices come from any of the police agencies, any of the commissions against corruption, any of the Commonwealth agencies, any of the four-letter agencies whose name we dare not speak. Uh, so they came with completely varied amounts of information as to what you should do and how you should go about it. Looks like what they're going to do is standardise that on a form, and so any agency, no matter what it was, if they hand somebody a notice to, to compel them to do something, will also have to include in that form what your legal rights are, how you can push back, who you can complain to, and um, uh, it'll actually tell you whether your compliance is voluntary or mandatory, uh, and if you have a complaint, who you can complain to, how to complain to make sure that the process is, uh, is okay. And that in itself will also be a, a big win because at the moment, uh, the, apparently the laws have been used six or seven times, uh, up to 20 odd times, uh, but because the information comes from different people, who knows what information is on there. Uh, so on the whole, sitting in this hearing yesterday, we did our piece, we told them how, you know, if they weren't very, very careful in how they compelled people to make changes to systems, they could uh, pretty much destroy the internet and billions of dollars of commerce and life as we know it, um, which did create a sympathetic response. Uh, if we can get these changes through, and it seemed like the guys in the room were very sympathetic to those changes, it will be a huge improvement to the things that the Australian technical community has been concerned about with these laws since they were first proposed about two years ago. Thank you. Life positive. Thank you so much. Any questions? Uh, Brendan Phillips in Spinet in New Zealand. Um, a lot of us have got kit in, New in Australia mm. that do business in Australia but don't actually have any representation in Australia. Yep. Who's going to hand us anything? Uh, under these laws, if you're providing a service in Australia to Australians, you need to comply with the law. So they will send you a, send the notice to your representative in Australia or they'll send it to you in New Zealand and you will need to comply in Australia. And if we haven't had a notice today, I can post that online? Yes. Yes, you are. The, uh, one of the transparency uh, requirements in the law is that a recipient of a notice you can do a transparency report at least one, or no more frequently than one every six months that can say how many notices you've received and you can always say at any time, I have never received a notice. Up until, of course, the point where you do. Today. Today, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up we'll have John to talk about Gammon. seems awfully enthusiastic. <laughs> okay, so my name is Martin Levy. I'm from Cloudflare, and I'm going to be talking about um, Galmon. So uh, uh, John Brewer, Internet Vandal. Um, I am talking about the Global Navigation Satellite System Monitoring Project called Galmon. And I really want to swipe the screen to turn the slide, but I know it's not going to work. Um, the Galmon project um, really started out as a way for its founder, Bert, to, um, he was angry with the Galileo project in Europe, and he really wanted a technical way to say, you guys are doing it wrong. You're doing a bad job. You're not spending EU money well. So he found, I think this is right so far, <laughs> He found um, a set of uh, GPS receivers that would output debug data, um, really interesting and uh, thorough debug data from the satellites uh, if you um, talk to these receivers in the correct way. Um, and he built a project out of that. Uh, so it is an open source and open data project community of um, well over 30 station operators. I screenshotted this a couple of weeks ago. I don't know how many there are now. How many, Martin? a lot, 30, 40, something like that, running more than 50 receivers around the world. And um, in addition to trying to keep Galileo Project honest, this 
project is now um, showing that the global health of all uh, global navigation satellite systems. Uh, global navigation satellite system is a generic term. Um, some people just say GPS, but it's the generic term for the set of navigation satellites that includes GPS, Galileo, Baidu, um, the GLONASS, the Russian one, uh, and um, other space-based aug augmentation systems. So why is he doing this? Um, aside from the bits that I already said, these are the published slides, I'm going by this. The world depends on properly functioning GNSS. Um, a lot of these systems are not transparent. Um, if you're as old as me and started using GPS in the early 90s, uh, you would know all about the fact that the US used to introduce a randomness factor. So you couldn't get a really exact fix on your GPS unless you were the military or the government or whatever. So anyway, we kind of really have no idea um, about the positions that these satellites are feeding us. Uh, I mean, we kind of just expect them to work, uh, but they are run by military departments or defense contractors or governments, and they are not gonna tell you if they screw up. And some of them have screwed up. So, um, where? Uh, Nearly 24-7 global coverage of Galileo and GPS. Um, there are receivers all over the world. There may or may not be a map in this slide deck. I don't remember because I made this for NZNOG a few weeks ago. But um, I have one in Singapore. Martin has one in California. Um, one of our colleagues in Tonga has one. There are a, an amazing amount of receivers in Northern Europe. Um, there, is there one in South Africa now? Yep. Two in South Africa, uh, MMC has one in Adelaide. Uh, we might, do we have one in Perth yet? We got one in Perth, all right. So yeah, kind of all over the, the, the world, New Zealand of course, um, all over the world and um, we are getting nearly 24 seven coverage of all of the satellites. So um, we do need some more um, receivers in some particular places so that we can make sure we get not just Galileo and GPS, but GLONASS and Baidu uh, 24 seven with redundant coverage um, because the data that is coming out of these receivers is really, really cool. So what do you get for hosting um, a receiver? You get nothing. In fact, you get to give some of your time away. Uh, you get to have a little device in your house. You get to feed it three watts of electricity, um, but you also get a website with coverage maps, a Twitter feed, um, you get a WhatsApp uh, group, which is quite nice. It has a little bit of support. Um, and if you still know how to IRC, you can go on an IRC channel. Um, how to join, basically you talk to um, Martin Levy over there because <laughs> he knows a lot more about it than I do. Um, but um, you need a, a computer and a USB port and a GPS receiver that plugs into that um, USB port, and it needs to have a U-Blox 8 or a U-Blox 9 chipset in it. Now, that may sound complicated, but really it means you have to spend $11 on AliExpress and not $6. Um, the, the, you just have to make sure you get the, the, the correct one. And actually, if you walk up to Martin and say, gimme, he might just give you one that has the U-Blox 8 or U-Blox 9 chipset in it. Um, I am using this on a Raspberry Pi 1. I mean, this device must be like eight years old by now. It does take a long time to compile the software, um, like five hours or something. <laughs> it does take five hours to compile, but once it's compiled, it actually runs just fine. I'm running it on a new installation of Raspbian on an eight um, gig SD card that I took out of my camera because it was useless for taking photos with. Um, and I just threw you know, hardware off the shelf on it and it just goes. Um, yep. Codes in GitHub. Here is a picture of my receiver. It is inside my apartment. Um, it is behind glass that has a film on it that attenuates GPS quite seriously. So I am going to move it outside. If I open the window, um, I get twice as many satellites as when the window is closed. So that's kind of sad, but that's, that's life. Right, um, here is the view uh, of one uh, receiver. This is not mine, I think this is Tonga, I think. Um, anyway, you get to see all of the um, different satellite networks coded G, E, or C 
I imagine the Chinese is the C is Baidu and the E is Galileo for Euro and the G is GPS for United States. Uh, and here is a list from the Galman, public.galman.eu, uh, sorry, the, the galma.eu website showing all of the current satellites that are being monitored and their health and their location and details about the time signals that they're putting out. So super, super, super detailed information on the health of the global systems for navigation. Uh, and some more detailed stats. So that's it, that's my last slide, um, but uh, I'll leave you with a picture here, little GPS receiver. Um, as I said, if you have any questions, Martin is definitely the best guy to ask, but I can help a little. Thank you. Thanks, John. And I think this will be our last talk for this afternoon is, uh, yeah, Xian Lang, come through. Challenges in optical network scaling. No? There we go. Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Xinliang from Equinix Singapore. So today I'm going to discuss about some challenges in optical network scaling. Uh, okay. So first of all, what is uh, OTN network? So basically it's uh, uh, ITO G709 standard to carry different type of uh, protocol over a single frame. And uh, uh, basically, customers' uh, payload just be wrapped into a single frame and uh, transport in between two endpoints transparently. Um, for protection purpose, uh, OPS switch will monitor dark fiber uh, power level and uh, perform a 50 millisecond switch over to backup link uh, once there is uh, uh, um, I mean the dis disturbance happen on the primary link. <clears throat> but uh, OTN network actually has some drawbacks, like uh, it's not quite uh, scalable. So most of the circuit you can provision is uh, like a, a fixed point-to-point uh, -point circuits. You cannot provision like any to any circuit. Uh, the strand capacity will make ROI much longer. So imagine if you have uh, uh, like a 60 gig uh, forecast uh, capacity for one direction. That means you need to always prepare um, like a 100G uh, max bounder or transponder for this direction. So the rest of uh, like 40G will be either wasted or in idle mode. Uh, every time when you're trying to allocate traffic from one direction to another, um, you will al always have to um, transfer the max, uh, the max bounder or transponder or buy the new one. <clears throat> And if you need the OPS switch uh, to protect the protection, uh, you will always have to configure the same channel in all intermediate nodes to provide the uh, protection. So in this case, uh, if you have a one direction from A to C, uh, sorry, A to B, uh, you need to configure the, uh, the, the same channel at uh, size C as well to create a pass-through circuit. So in case the, the link in between A to B down, so the traffic will still go through C as a backup pass. So this slide just try to show that every time you think about expansion or you want to add new sites um, into existing OTN network, you will have to always add a new rodem at a um, both remote side to en enable this direction. Um, also following with a lot of um, reconfiguration and uh, fiber patching. <clears throat> so if you look at the side four, you will notice that uh, uh, side four slowly from a 2D rodem become a 3D and a 4D rodem. So uh, more hours actually will bring more troubles for daily operations. So um, potentially it will increase the OPEX as well. So um, what options uh, we have to actually overcome this kind of uh, drawbacks and uh, uh, make uh, the OTN ne network more scaling? So in uh, next two slides, I actually I will discuss about uh, two technology for your consideration. 
the first one is uh, eVPN. So, so nowadays, actually, uh, L2 VPN uh, is widely uh, uh, used in uh, service provider or enterprise environment to provide uh, transport, point-to-point -point transport service for their customers. So uh, eVPN is the next generation solution for both L2 and L3 services. So compared with uh, VPRS, um, it's actually uh, the, the flood and learn mechanism. Uh, eVPN actually, they separate the control plane and the data plane and they use uh, MPBGP to uh, advertise and learn uh, all the um, MAC address, uh, reachabilities, and uh, distribute to all the lift switches. So after that, I can simply create uh, uh, like a L2 VPN uh, suit wire or either VPWS service to provide the uh, transport service to customers. So the second technology for consideration is uh, second routing. <clears throat> so actually, second routing is not a new technology. So um, I guess most, uh, some of you maybe already deploy second routing in your network. And uh, so it's a source-based routing protocol. So basically, the the source route, the source router actually will define a path to destination, and uh, encode this path um, into the packet header as a list of instruction. So the re remaining router actually just need to execute this instruction and uh, uh, forward the packet to the destination. Uh, it is easy to deploy second routing because it's not additional protocol, but it suggests additional uh, packet header uh, for existing IGP protocols like uh, ISIS and uh, OSPF. So the only thing you need to do is just like uh, upgrade your software to higher version to support this uh, second routing. Uh, it support uh, topology independent LFA for any link and uh, no um, protection, failing protections. So the traditional LFA cannot protect a full protection for all the destination due to some technology, um, topology design, but uh, if you use a TI uh, LFA, it, uh, it will actually calculate uh, post converging paths as a backup pass and carry the traffic uh, in any failing case. So the last one, the traffic engineering uh, supporter by segment routing. So it, actually it can create a policy to steer the traffic to the destination via um, uh, specific paths, and uh, it will teach each router um, how to forward a packet to this, uh, through this specific path, instead of uh, following the IGP shortest path. So in this scenario, if I have uh, one packet from router A to router 4, uh, by following the IGP shortest path, they will go through this uh, uh, green path. So by using uh, SRT, actually I can create another path, this, uh, this red path, uh, but just with uh, higher preference. And uh, at the same time, I can still keep the, red uh, the green pass as a backup pass, but just uh, uh, with a lower preference. So when the time the red pass down, this green pass will just kick in, and uh, the packet still can go through to the destinations. So here's the use case. Um, um, to see when we combine the OT network with uh, bo uh, both uh, segment routing and uh, uh, eVPN. So here we have four sites in two separate rooms. Um, for the OT network, I just need both, uh, uh, I, I just need the most uh, basic components like amplifier, max demux, and some DCI switches to handle the physical point-to-point -point connection from leaf switch to span switches. Um, for underlay, I can use either MPRS or uh, IGP ISIS to um, get uh, uh, reach, reachability information. Uh, and all the span switch, switch here will play route reflector role with uh, BGP EVPN pairing with all the uh, leaf switches to advertise and learn all the uh, customer MAC address and uh, distribute to the rest of leaf switches. So that's, I can create uh, um, like a L2 VPN, uh, sort of wire or VPWS on any port of any switches. So now actually I can do like a any to any um, uh, transport connection for my customers. So how about this, uh, traffic engineering? So by using um, 
Segment routing, actually, I can create three types of uh, circuits. The first one is called unprotect circuit. So basically, I just need to um, create a policy with uh, just a single color uh, available um, for these nodes and uh, disable the fallback um, function. So when this link down, the traffic won't really uh, follow to the rest of um, available IGP paths. So the second uh, circuit I can create is called protector pass. Um, it is just uh, another policy, but with uh, two color available with a different preference. So when the, when the primary link down, uh, the, the traffic will just switch to the uh, protect pass, the secondary pass within 50 milliseconds. The third one is called redundant circuit. Actually, it just uh, consists, consists of uh, two unprotected circuit, but uh, on totally different uh, infrastructure, different switch, different um, fiber, patch panel, even dark fiber. Um, so it can create like a permanent uh, redundancy for customers, no matter the hardware failure or any link failure happen. So here are some useful resources for, uh, for your reference in case uh, uh, some of you uh, haven't deployed your, your interest with uh, second routing or EVPN. Uh, I guess uh, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions? I'm just curious, is this a, a problem Equinix are having or this is just? Uh, no. no. Okay. This, yeah. This is just a okay. purpose. Cool. All right. Any questions? Okay. No, that's yeah. it. Thank you so much. And I believe with that, we've come to the end of this session. Um, 10 minutes early for the tea break, more or less. Thank you very much. <laughs>